Almighty God, thank you that we get to gather in your name, in your presence today. Lord, thank you that we have been able to witness in the powerful form of baptism the reality of your transforming and saving work. And God, right now I ask as we open up the Bible, as we open up your communication to us, that indeed you would speak. God, that you would take your word and let it have its way in each heart, God. God, I pray for the person, whether in the room or at home or viewing or listening at some other point in time, God, that the person who has, uh, who is coming this morning in desperation, Lord. Maybe they've not been able to sleep last night. They've been crying out all night. Oh, God, today, may they hear you speak to them. Teach them, draw them, encourage, support, and change them, Lord. And God, I want to pray for the person maybe on the far other end of the spectrum who has no sense of even wanting to be here or wanting to listen or, or even believing that you exist. So certainly they're not in desperation crying out for you. But I ask, God, that you would surprise them today, that you would shine your light in a way that penetrates through whatever those walls are or whatever the skepticism is. And God, make wherever we are, this place or wherever somebody's gathered around your word right now, God, make it holy ground because you are here with us. For your glory and our good, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please. Now, I want to ask you to do a couple of things here. I want to ask you to find a Bible and uh, find a couple of places, even if you're brand new to looking into a Bible, kind of Christianity or church is all relatively new to you, that's awesome. We want it to be that way. We always want people here who uh, are brand new to the whole process, and so it's something you're looking into. Even if you have to kind of look in the table of contents, there are Bibles in the backs of some of the chairs around you, so you can grab it. We're going to go two places. The first one is the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, so if you want to turn there. And then the other one, if you want to put a finger in that I'm going to ask you to turn to partway through the message, is the second book of the Bible. It's Exodus uh, chapter 33. So both of those is where we're going to look today. Um, but I want to give it just a couple of, of words of uh, one of thanks and one of instruction. Uh, the first one, so la- I'm thankful for Matt teaching last Sunday. We had kind of a one-off out of our study of the Gospel of Mark on Orphan Sunday. What a powerful gathering that was last week. And um, thankful for that. And I'm thankful for those. By the way, if you're brand new today to Mars Hill, awesome. Thanks for being here. We have first-time visitors every week. And I, our hope and prayer is that as quickly as you are able and ready, and as quickly as it would make sense that this, if this is a good fit for you, that you would kind of move from being a visitor to being an insider, you know, pretty quickly. We want you to feel warm and welcome and that this is your home. So glad you're here today. But if you have been a part of Mars Hill, Many, many of you knew where I was and where Dana and I were, where our family was last Sunday, and some of you, a bunch of you prayed for us, so I want to say thank you. We were conducting my son's, I was conducting my son's wedding last Sunday at noon here, 10 a.m. in Colorado. It was an outdoor wedding uh, on November 13th in Colorado, so how, how amazing was that? I know, when they told us that, we're like, is there an indoor option? And uh, it turns out the five days we were out there, the one day where the weather actually was not so bad for being outside was was last Sunday. It was incredible. And so, so my son, his wife, I now have a daughter-in-law. That's pretty, that's pretty wild. Um, you never kind of, anyway, it's, it's great. And she's awesome. Her dad is a pastor. And so these two kids got married on a Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. I'm like, well, what happened to the sacred <laughs> worship hour of Sunday morning? But it led to some conversations. We were thinking maybe kind of like baptism, you know, maybe we ought to do, because weddings are a sacred, blessed of God thing. Maybe we should just do those during church services all the time, right? Come on, this is kind of, go with me here. This could catch on. Uh, so anybody looking to get married and you want to just plug it in as part of the service, we get, I'm sure that's a less expensive option than some of these venues out there these days. So uh, maybe we could, I don't know, we could look at that. But we had a great, great time and a great time with my now daughter-in-law and her family. It was awesome. The other thing I want to draw your attention to, Aaron was being uh, kind with uh, watching out for talking about Christmas too early. By the way, I, I was at a mall like three weeks ago when it was already set up for Christmas. Anybody seen these things? I mean, yeah, the Christmas music going in the stores already. Anyway, we have what is our annual Christmas focal point at Mars Hill that we call our gift offering. And I just want to draw your attention to that because it is upon us. There are letters 
on the welcome desk out there, the information table to grab. Take it, it fully explains pretty much everything. If it's something new to you uh, or if you've been a part of it and want to kind of re, uh, remind yourself and your family what's going on and where our focal point will be this year, it's something we started many years ago. And the honest um, just motivation behind it is to celebrate what Christmas is. Christmas, and it's kind of why we give gifts, you know, across the culture, across the globe, is because Christmas is the time we mark the greatest gift ever given, and it's Jesus. And so in the spirit of God's generosity, and of course that's one of our core values, we want to be like God. We want our hearts to grow increasingly courageously generous. And so in, the, in light of his over and above gift to us and his son Jesus, what we do at Mars Hill is we set this mechanism in place to celebrate that. We hope and truly believe it should be and could be an act of worship. If you're a single adult, you engage you and the Lord together. If you're married or with a family, it's a great mechanism for family discipleship and growth and, and coming together to worship God together as you go through the process of saying, Lord, is there something above and beyond our normal types of giving to your church that you want us to engage in? And then you can see the process for that and ways to give that. It's been something that's been very significant, I think, on the discipleship and worship side, but certainly on the practical side as well. And so this year, we usually designate something special. What we're doing this year is designating the uh, reconstruction, I don't know what the right word is, but the refurbishment, the, the facilitation of holding services and enhancing what currently exists as our student room, basically the room that's right beneath us right here right now. And so as you can tell, not just today, but um, by God's grace, all these Sundays for quite some time, God is continuing to enable our church to include more and more people. And so on Sunday mornings, that means, you know, we've got, uh, we've got to use God's, uh, follow God's lead and use the, the, the smarts he's given us, the sanctified uh, ability to, to plan and think and be good stewards of the space he's given us. So we're trying to figure out what to do because um, it is not, listen, it's not an option to say, stop inviting your neighbors. That's not an option. We're, we're commissioned uh, by the Lord Jesus himself to make disciples and to reach and to extend and to share share Jesus Christ with those who don't yet know him. So that, shutting things down is not an option. Figuring out how to open space for those we invite is, is, our, is our task. And so we know that when we're, we're on it, we're praying, we're thinking, we're planning. It's very intentional about the longer-term things, but we believe the short-term, a short-term, what we hope will be a very good solution to some of the extra space we need for worship is to do this, what we need to do with the room below us. It includes a lot of soundproofing because right now the bleed between the two is, would hinder uh, the, the worship service down there, some AV work that needs to be done so that everything that happens and is experienced in the room below us happens in real time without a delay, all that kind of stuff. And ideally, we want it to be a room that might even be very appealing for some to choose to go there, not just, in essence, kind of overflow kind of a thing. So we believe it'll, it'll, it'll uh, help us 60, maybe 70 extra seats every worship service. And certainly, for the dollar, it's a way better, uh, especially short-term plan than any kind of new construction square footage costs and those kinds of things. So that's what it will go to, whatever, whatever uh, you bring, whatever God enables us to give in our gift offering this year. Okay? Thank you. All right, let's go. Mark chapter 9. Here we go. I want to read the first 13 verses. We have transitioned in our study of the Gospel of Mark. Remember the first, up through first eight, uh, almost full eight chapters, it is about being clear on Jesus as the promised Messiah, getting the identity of Jesus right. He's the king. He starts by saying the kingdom of God is near, the kingdom of God is among you, the kingdom of God is at hand, and by the way, that's because he's the king and he's here. And it culminates in that glorious thing that Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And now as soon as that's clear and that statement is made, now the turn happens and we're headed for the cross. So the identity of Jesus is clear. Now the purpose of Jesus is the focal point. The mission of Jesus, he came to die. So he begins to tell them that. And we saw a couple weeks ago, there was four of those clear things that Mark records of him trying to prep his group for what's coming. They're having a hard time adjusting, They're having a hard time seeing it, they're having a hard time embracing it, which is where today's incident, event occurs. It's known, if you've studied your Bible much, but it's called the transfiguration. It, it, it's incredible. All right, hang, hang tight. Here we go. I'm going to read from the New American Standard following whatever translation you, you've got there. Mark 9, verse 1. 
And Jesus was saying to them, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it's come with power. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and brought them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his garments became radiant and exceedingly white, as no launderer on earth can whiten them. Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he didn't know what to answer because they were so terrified. Then a cloud formed, overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud and said, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And all at once they looked around and saw no one with them anymore except Jesus alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, he gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. They seized upon that statement, discussing with one another what rising from the dead meant. They asked him, saying, Why is it that the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he said to them, Elijah does come and restores all things, and yet how is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has indeed come, and they did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written of him. Wow, okay, good stuff. Let me ask you a question to kind of set us up and get us started for our focal point this morning. Is there anything in your experience that um, necessitates being paired with something else for you to enjoy it or even participate in it? Like, for me, I've kind of, this may be a statement of being wimpy, so forgive me. But, like, I've gotten to the point where I don't even drink or want coffee if I don't have cream in it. So, I, I know. So, anyway, I, 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 at one point years ago, somebody says, well, I'm a big girl now. I drink it black. And I was like, she was shaming me. But anyway, <laughs> I don't mind to admit it. I don't want coffee without the cream. Do you have anything that, ne- by necessity in your, in your uh, um, in how you live, that you, by your choice, for you it says, man, I got to have this to go with that or I don't want it. Anybody got one? I don't hear What's yours? Peanut butter and jelly. Thank you. Yeah, I don't want a peanut butter sandwich, and I don't want a jelly sandwich. Yeah, I got vanilla wafers and milk. Like, I could go a whole box of vanilla wafers and a whole thing of milk, but I don't want the vanilla wafers by themselves. All right, who else? Anybody got one? Anybody? Oh, yeah, we're all, like, shy today. Come on. So I don't want this without that. Anybody? Say it again. Potato soup. Yeah, I would never want that without saltine crackers. <laughs> very good. I like that. Steak on potato. Potato soup and saltine crackers. Very good. Don't give me one without the other. Very good. I, I got some, I, I don't know, chips and salsa, anybody? Come on. Yeah, all right. Milk and cookies. Yeah, thank you. Uh, coffee and cream. So I don't know what you want. Here's, here's the deal. What's going on in our text today? We, we know it as the transfiguration. And by the way, it is all those things. It is this grand and glorious theological cornerstone for all of humanity to be clear on that Jesus is God. All right, that, that's what's going on for sure. Jesus has been robed in human flesh and he's peeling back, he's taking off the disguise in a sense. He's, he's pulling back the veil to see the true identity, the glory of God radiating. And, and isn't it fascinating how how Mark, you know, who we believe is kind of relaying Peter's firsthand account, accounts here, how he kind of describes, he's just like, ah, he was transfigured. Like, it's hard to kind of put more descriptors to it. It was one of those things, you would have had to have been there. In fact, even though how he describes the effect on his clothes, he was so glorious. The glory of God shining, bursting out of his being, made his clothes white and radiant and glowing. And again, there's, it's impossible to describe. He said, I don't know, whiter than any launderer on earth can whiten it? In essence, you don't know until you've seen it that there is a white out there. There's a category and a quality of white that you didn't know previously existed. Isn't that wild? I love we sang the song, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. You know, he made my sins, though my sins were, oh man, I'm forgetting the words. In, right. uh, to, uh, the crimson stain, he made it white as snow. That's our best guess, right? 
And by the way, if you're looking for things to be thankful for this week at Thanksgiving, week, just be thankful you don't live in Buffalo, New York, right? <laughs> they got a feeling what white as snow has looked like up there. But white as snow, white as wool, white as milk, white as what? I don't know, but there's a white that we don't even know. These guys were like, that's what that was. So it's this theological statement for sure. Jesus is God embodying in his being the very glory of God. He says, I'm going to take you guys up here and give you a glimpse of it. He tells them, now don't tell anybody about this whole thing until after I rise from the dead. But then tell, and they have, and we hear. And that's what this event is. But it's more than just a theological cornerstone to build our understanding of Jesus off of. Because in the context, it's paired purposefully with this whole brand new and unwelcomed discussion of death. And the, ver- the first word in verse 1 is, and Jesus was saying to them. And there's times in the narrative, in the, in the gospel narratives, where, you know, there's gaps between this event that he records and the next one or whatever the case is. In fact, we get in verse 2 that the time frame, the gap between what he says in verse 1 and what they experience on the mountain is six days. That's kind of interesting. But the flow here in verse 1 is within the context of what they've been discussing. So going back into the end of chapter 8, remember what they've been discussing. They got the statement right. You're, you're the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Great. Now Jesus says, good, now we're going to Jerusalem. I'm going to get crucified and I'm going to raise, be rise, I'm going to raise from the dead. And oh, by the way, remember how chapter 8 ended. Of course, this is kind of shocking to them to begin with. Like, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Remember how Peter took it? He, said, he pulled Jesus aside to correct him and say, uh-uh. Not today, Jesus. We're here for all the victory forms of Messiah coming. We're here for the takeover. We're here for the celebration. We're here for the inauguration of of the new kingdom. Jesus said, no, 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 I'm here for crucifixion. Peter was so distraught by that. And everybody's a little bit distraught, and especially when he then says to him, if anyone wants to follow me, what do they have to do? Remember? Come on. They've got to take up their cross. Wait a minute, what? So this... Discussion of death very rudely is now permeating the group dramatically. Not only that the Messiah is beginning to make it clear he's here to die, but that he's calling his followers to be willing to go die. In fact, you have to take up your cross and follow me. In that context, what does he say? And this is where verse 1 fits in. He's saying, listen, we're talking about death, but death must be paired with. That's what verse 1 is saying. And Jesus is saying, truly, I'm going to say to you, there's some of those who are standing here in this group, everybody's starting to get a little bit bummed out about this whole talk of death. You're not going to taste death until you see the remedy for death. Until you see what God intends to, by necessity, pair with death. And that's the leverage, the full leverage of the power of the kingdom of God. the antidote to death, the remedy for death, the solution to death. And we see that every time in all of these times where Jesus is preparing them for what's coming. He always includes the resurrection. Go down to verse 9. That's as they come back down the mountain. He says, look, don't tell anybody about this until until I'm risen from the dead. They're always paired together. I love it. You don't have to drink coffee without cream. And you and I don't have to deal with death apart from the promise of the power of God for resurrection. That's what this transfiguration is to emphasize and to how it serves necessarily to those who would consider following Jesus. But isn't it an interesting phrase that he says, those who, those, there's people right here gathered here among us who aren't going to taste death. It's an interesting way to say it, isn't it? What does he mean by that? The word literally means to to perceive the flavor of it. And I think what he's doing is he's not shying away from, he's not apologizing for the elephant in the room that he has now put right dead center in the room, and that is that he's come to die and you've got to decide whether you're going to take up your cross and follow him or not. In essence, you've got to get the full flavor of death. And he doesn't say, oh, sorry, y'all. I'm so sorry I upset your sensitivities. I'm so sorry. I know that was uncomfortable. Let's just go on to something else. He doesn't do that. But what he does do is, look, I'm going to pair that taste of death that you have to let 
sit in your mouth for a while. You, you need to perceive the flavor of it. But I'm going to give you the solution for it. And so let me ask you, have you ever taken the time to perceive the flavor of it? It, it, it's critical. I know we don't prefer to. I know it's not comfortable. I know it's not pleasant. It, it's sad. It's discouraging. But it's critical. It's essential. There's a verse in the Old Testament that says it's better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting. I said, no, it's not. We had a great time at the wedding last Sunday and the reception after. They had a waffle bar. Come on. They had a donut wall. I like that way better than funerals. We went to a wedding last night. The food was fantastic. It was fun. Everybody was happy. People danced. That's, isn't that way better than a funeral? In fact, probably some of us, our preferences, and I don't know if you're this far, but you, I, we can imagine going this far saying, I'm not doing funerals. I'm kind of the, just the wedding guy. The wedding and the party and the anniversary and the celebration, the graduation and the birthday, I'll do those. Funerals, uh uh-uh. Yeah. The Bible says, not not like it's better, like in some dark, weird way, but better for the condition of our soul long term. At a minimum, we need to go there because there we can get the taste of. There we can perceive the flavor of death. This is what he says. For, and here's what the flavor tastes like. It's an awareness that it's the destiny of everyone. And the living, while they're still living, because after that, it's a little too late. You got more than just a taste of death. You got the full dose, right? But while you're still living, to perceive that this is our destiny. Do you know everybody in the crowd to whom Jesus says this in Mark 9, 1, every one of them died. Does that catch you off guard? Does that surprise you? Do you know what's true of everybody sitting in this room today? Yeah. Barring Jesus' return uh, and rapture before that, the reality is everybody in this room will die. So you you can see where Ecclesiastes makes sense then, right? And where Jesus is saying, look, you guys are all bummed out about all this talk of death and take up your cross and wait a minute, I thought you were going to go reign and, and make all the nations be subject to Israel again. What's going on here? You're talking about dying? Yeah, but let me just make this clear and get you guys where you need to go in your understanding. Is it truly, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God coming in power. And what does he mean? And then that's where it transitions into verse 2. The remedy to this death, and it by necessity is always paired with. Isn't that cool? You never have one without the other. You can't have one without the other. Some of you are going to see, and in this case, it means to fully experience, to fully experience the power of God. And these guys, these representatives of us, Peter, James, and John, they were up there. They hiked literally up the mountain. They were there when the cloud literally completely encircled them and embraced them, and they were hugged tight by this fog, this cloud of God. They heard the voice of God. They saw the glory of God burst from Jesus. They had the full experience. This is what it means when Jesus here in verse 1 says they're going to see the power of the kingdom of God, which has to be paired with death and which is personified in Jesus, our Savior. Isn't that wild? They saw the power and glory of Jesus. Look at it in verses 2 and 3. Isn't that amazing how it said? Look at verse 2. Six days later, they took him up to Peter, James, and John, up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. What is that? Wow, okay. I guess we'll have to kind of get a clearer view of what that means and what that looked like specifically when we see Jesus in heaven. Verse 3, his garments become so radiant and exceedingly white. Nobody can whiten them that way. And then we have verses 4 through 6. We we have this Elijah and Moses there talking with Jesus. Isn't that wild? And there's so many things about this that that bring up more questions than they provide answers. Isn't that wild? Like, how do they know that was Elijah and Moses? This is before photographs, right? 
before video, videos of these guys, before, probably before oil painting portraits. They weren't, it was like a hall of Moses and Elijah painting somewhere in Israel. How do they know it's them? They just do. It's kind of cool. I, I think maybe this is a little tip off as to what heaven's going to be like. I don't think we're going to be introduced to anybody in heaven. You'll know everybody automatically right away. Isn't that kind of wild? Oh, there's Paul. Oh, there's David, King David. Oh, there's Nathan the prophet. Oh, there's Samuel. Oh, there's Mark. Mark, we studied your book for five years in church. <laughs> that was awesome. Or something like that. But we'll know these guys, right? So they, there's Elijah. There's Moses. And then they go on, and, and, and the, the cloud comes over. And, and, and the, the great statement that Peter says is, it's good for us to be here. Yeah, right. That's exactly right. What I want us to do today is go there also. They were there physically. It is good that they were there. And it was good that they were faithful later to tell us about it. But by faith and through the lenses of faith, I want us, and God will enable us, if we're willing, to see just as equally, just as convincingly, and to experience, meaning see by experience, not just you know, pass by as a spectacle. Oh, look at that. No, but I mean enter in, be enveloped by, be illumined by the glory of God the way they were. See like that. It was good, Peter said, that it's good that we're here. Let it be the same for you. It's good that you're there. It's good that I'm here through the eyes of faith. Let us see the same thing they saw, experience the same thing they experienced. But then Peter goes on, and he's, 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 as you can imagine, very afraid. He says, oh, let's build some tabernacles. What's going on there? And that's another one of those mysterious questions. I don't know. Is he just saying, ah, I like to build stuff? Uh, or is he, is he saying, um, oh, this is so great. Let's just build some shelter so we can camp out here a while. Maybe you've been in experiences where you've been in the presence of God and you really don't want it to end. But it could be, it's a, we, we know at the end of verse 6 that whatever his reaction was was prompted by fear. And I love Peter, don't you? I mean, he just, if, when he doesn't know what to do, before he thinks about it, he just starts talking. Let's just come up with something. Hey, man, how many of you know what to do a show? And how you can relate to that? Hmm. Kind of the firstborn type A's, whatever. We just want to, yeah, we can do that sometimes. But maybe... There's something bouncing through his scared-to-death soul that harkens back to what he knew of the Scriptures and God showing up in other places on a mountaintop in a cloud with somebody. So that's why I want us to go back to Exodus 33. If you've got your Bible, go back there. Exodus 33. And this is Moses. And maybe seeing Moses there prompts the, this memory of what he's studied in the Scriptures, what Peter has studied and maybe this is part of the terror that he feels. So look in verse 18 of Exodus 33. This is one of those times Moses is up on the mountain meeting with God. And I think it's in between the first tablets that God gave and the replacement tablets because Moses threw the other ones to the ground and broke them. But here we go. Verse 18 says, And Moses says to God, I pray, show me your glory. Woo. Would you give that a thumbs up or a thumbs down on a good thing to pray? Yeah, I have a thumbs up. Have you, ever said, have you ever prayed that to God? God, show me you in your undisguised, undiluted fullness. I want to know you for you. I want to know who you are, God. I want to know you more. I want to know you personally. I want to know you better. Isn't that powerful? Moses is like, I want to see the godness of God. I want to see you, God, in all of your godness. Show me your glory. And in that context, look at verse 19. God says, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. And I'm going to proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. I'll be gracious on whom I'm going to be gracious. But check this out, verse 20. But you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. And in one hand, we can understand that makes sense. The unbridled, almighty power and glory of the creator of the universe, pure and perfect in every way. And to think for a moment that we could stare into that unpolluted, unfiltered glory face to face when we are those who've been created of the dirt, we are the dust of the earth, we are the clay vessels, and on top of that we are the polluted clay vessels. We are full of immorality. 
Like Isaiah, when he had a vision of God, said, oh, i I, I got to put my hand over my mouth. I, I'm, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. So it makes sense. It, it's, a comparison would be, can, can the lint you pull out of your dryer filter, how can it stand in the presence of a raging campfire? It can't. And neither can we. In the presence of the glory of God, this is what God is saying. In verse 21, then the Lord said, Behold, there's going to be a place here by me on the mountain. You're going to stand there in the rock. I'm going to come by. And when my glory is passing by, I'm going to put you in this cleft in the rock, and I'm going to cover you with my hand until I've passed by. And, and then I'll take my hand away, and you can see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Maybe there on the mountain, Peter's got this bouncing through his mind and heart adding to the terror of the sheer splendor of the glory of God. He's like, oh, we're looking into the face of the glory of God. Nobody can look at His face and live. Quick, build some shelters. I don't know. Or perhaps, for our consideration, he also knew that the result of Moses going up on a high mountain, hearing the voice of God, the mountain then being covered in a cloud, covered in the presence of God where God spoke, that the result of that when Moses came back down was that God had instructed him to build a tabernacle. We don't know what's going on in Peter's heart here, but here's what we do know. Tabernacles, whether the one true tabernacle as given, instructed by God in the Old Testament for the Israelites, or other forms of the same kind of a thing in pagan religions around the world through history, whether a temple or whatever, they all at their heart serve as some form of mediator, some form of bridge between mankind and the divine. That's kind of the role of a temple or a tabernacle. It's to be this place where we, we can find a bridge to God where sacrifices can be made, where rites and rituals can be performed to gain entrance into the presence of the divine or to gain acceptance, right? This is what a tabernacle is, the ways it has served in human religions. Maybe Peter's got that in mind. Maybe he's overcome like Isaiah was when he had that vision in Isaiah 6. Maybe like, oh, I'm going to die. We need a mediator. I need a bridge. I'm unworthy. There's Jesus. I'm staring into the face of the glory and power of God quick, I don't belong here, quick, I'm going to get consumed, quick, I'm going to die, quick, we need, to, we need to build a bridge here, a tabernacle, so we start performing some sacrifices and build a bridge. This is what he's responding to because he's seeing the glory of Jesus. Jesus is being revealed in all of His glory, but it's not just the glory of Jesus emanating from Him not just His radiance coming out of Him, like Peter. Isn't this awesome how Peter later says, look, I want to tell you about this experience. We didn't, we didn't follow these cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. And when he talks about the coming of Jesus in power, it's not just, hey, it's fishes to, you know, five loaves, two fish, or whatever, two fish, five loaves, feeding thousands. It's not just walking on water. It's not just even resurrection. He's referring back to this moment that we're reading about today. And he says, look, we were there. We saw it. We saw his majesty. He received honor and glory from the Father when the voice came to him. Look how Peter calls it, from the majestic glory. And said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard that voice. It came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. So Peter's testifying to this. It's this glory of Jesus that came from Jesus. You remember the story of Moses when he was up on the mountain and met with God similarly? Moses started to glow. Do you remember that? But that glory faded over time because it was a reflective glory. What Peter and James and John saw was a totally different form of glory. It was intrinsic. It was God himself being glorified. The power of God is Jesus. And so he saw this glory, but he also saw who Jesus was being revealed by testimony. The testimony of Elijah and Moses in verse 4. The testimony of the Father speaking in verse 7. How strong is that? Why is this Elijah and Moses? Do you know what's going on there? This is a clear communication that the whole Old Testament is about Jesus. Moses is the great lawgiver, the one through whom God gave His commandments and ordinances to Israel. The law, 
one part of the Old Testament. Elijah is the spokesperson or the representative of all the Old Testament prophets who pictured and told about the coming of Messiah, and they're the ones there testifying. And even as they fade away, they're fading away as a testimony, isn't it? As they say, we've been pointing to Him. We've been the setup crew. We're the, we're the lead act. Here's the main. Here's the answer. Here's what has to be paired with death, this power of God. It's revealed in Jesus. And then the testimony in verse 7 is God speaking Himself, not just the Old Testament, not just Moses and Elijah. And isn't it interesting, we have twice that we know of where God spoke from heaven audibly for people to hear in the ministry of Jesus. One was at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, when He's being baptized by John, setting up the identity of Jesus and the, and the clarity on, on who Jesus is before He begins to heal, before He begins to introduce the kingdom is at hand. And now we have it here as He begins to make His march to the cross. And so this is Jesus revealed. What has to be paired with the reality for all of us, which is death. So let me ask you, have you ever taken the time to look into who Jesus actually is? I mean, to go beyond the sound bites that our culture has filled us with. Ah, Jesus, yeah, good teacher. Yeah, G- whatever. Whatever, the, whatever you've heard. Have you gone beyond what you've heard to find out for yourself? I think it's interesting in verse 2 that these guys had to hike up a high mountain by themselves. You ever hiked up a high mountain? Doesn't happen quickly, does it? Got to go on a cool mountain hiking trip this August with Abby and a group from our church and a bunch of others. And four times we went up over passes that were around 12,000 feet carrying 35-pound backpack. (sighs) Yeah, that takes intentionality and perseverance and effort. So what I'm asking you is, that's what these guys had to do. When it says Jesus took them up on a mountain, high mountain by themselves, they, they weren't there like that. It took some time and intentionality to get away, to focus on, to be ready to see Jesus. What about you? Have you ever set aside some time to maybe start talking to God and keep talking and keep listening? Like Moses said, I want to see your glory. Have you ever prayed that? And then been persistent enough to make sure that your heart really is open and really is receptive. Have you ever hiked that high mountain? God, I'm not just going to go with the default settings that the culture has fed me with. I'm going to find out for myself. Have you ever considered to dig into the Scriptures? We're in the Gospel of Mark. What about reading through the whole Gospel of John, asking those questions? God, if you're who this book says you are. Help me to see it and understand it. Have you ever done that? Climbed that mountain? Have you ever asked some others? Hey, James, Peter, and John were there with Moses and Elijah. They were asking others. Have you ever asked others to learn from them just as an exploratory, a serious exploratory process for you? Have you ever maybe considered, I'm gonna, I'm, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to church every Sunday for six months, a year. Have you ever taken it that seriously? It, it, it's required. And here's a great tragedy. There will be, a, the, the Bible's clear, there is a judgment day. Every soul stands before God. And I believe on judgment day, there's going to be a lot of people who aren't going to stand there and say, they're not going to say, um, hey, Jesus, I intentionally and thoroughly investigated everything and I have decided you are not worth believing in. You know, after a careful search, I've decided to reject you as Savior Jesus. You know what most people are going to say on Judgment Day? Golly, you know, I never really looked into that. Isn't that, I mean, how tragic is that? If there's a Judgment Day, like the Bible says, to show up to that day and go, you know what, I never gave it six months of intentional effort. I never gave it a year. I never asked some questions. I never read it for myself. I never talked and asked God to reveal himself. Really? Why would you not? Why would you not? And so these guys, Peter, James, and John, as Peter says this, here's what we saw, changes everything. I I just want us to see it. I want to see Jesus for who he is. 
And wouldn't it have been cool to have been one of those three guys to get to go see it? But here's what Jesus said after he rose again that I hope will be encouraging to you and to me. Um, through faith in him, we really do get that firsthand equivalent experience of knowing him, being surrounded and embraced by that, like they, like they were by the presence of God and that cloud that descended on the top of that mountain, by the voice of God. We really do, we really can walk that personally, that firsthand, that intimately with God. In fact, from the lips of Jesus himself, after he rose from the dead, wouldn't it have been cool to be one of the ones that saw him physically risen? Yeah, of course, just like it would have been cool to be there on the Mount of Transfiguration. But some of them who saw them after he rose, some of the ladies, they came back and they started telling the other apostles, they, we saw him, we saw him, we saw him. Some of them went, I think, okay. But some of them, one of them I, I share the name with, right, Thomas? He's the notorious, what, the doubting Thomas, right? He's the one that's like, uh-uh, no way, y'all, uh-uh. I will not, his statement's pretty strong, I will not believe it unless I see it for myself. And in that context, here's what Jesus said. He said, because you have seen me, you believe. But check out what Jesus says, and this is for you and me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. And it is through that belief that we actually see. Yeah, I would have loved to have been on that mount, I think. I'm going to be scary as I'll get out, right? But encouraging. Because these guys were going to go die. All but John was going to be killed for their faith in Jesus. And they needed the strength and encouragement of seeing what they saw. But really, remember, it was only Peter, James, and John that saw it. The rest of them had to take it by faith and experience the same amount of strength and encouragement. And so, my brothers and sisters, the remedy, the necessary pairing for death is the power of God, and the power of God is Jesus. I would say... The other side of the same coin is, is the same, is equivalent, and that is that the necessary pairing, not just for death, but the necessary pairing for life is Jesus. If through the eyes of faith you can see it and understand it, a walk with God that is so filled with encouragement, so filled with hope, so filled with purpose, so filled with strength, that we can grow to embrace the call of take up your cross and follow me. You know, Okay. Not only can I do that, I can eagerly do that. In fact, no place I'd rather be. And so my brothers and sisters, as the Father said to those guys, they believed in Jesus, they bowed the knee, they trusted him, they were going to be filled with this, uh, the strength from this experience, this encounter with Jesus, and then the marching orders from the Father were what? What did he say? This is my son, listen to him. In the same way that when they kind of, their eyes opened, when they looked up again, there's no more Elijah, there's no more Moses, there's just Jesus. This is what the author of Hebrews tells us, then let us run our race with our eyes fixed on Jesus as he commands, as he clarifies, as he instructs, like he does, he begins on the way down the mountain, he gives them some commands, he gives them some clarifications so they understand, they're like, what's this whole Elijah thing about? He's like, let me, let me make it, that was John the Baptist, this is how we are to live. So the necessary pairing with death is Jesus, the necessary pairing with life is Jesus. Listen to him, follow him, trust him, rely on him, rest in him. When he commands it, obey it, when he clarifies it, trust it. Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you for what you've shown us. I thank you for what you've testified that is true. I thank you for what Peter and John and the others recorded for us that they experienced. And I thank you through the miraculous work of your Spirit, we too are able to see the power of God and know that it is not just a power display for display's sake, but it's a transfigured Christ for the sake of transforming us so that your power, God, gives us life where we can only produce and experience death, that your power, God, gives us hope and strength where we are terrified and trembling, where your power, God, reconciles us to you 
You're perfect and holy. We are sinful and finite. And yet you've made us one. You've brought us into your family. You've made us your children and citizens. That's your power. And yes, God, to transform us, not just terrify us. Oh, we want to submit to you, Jesus. We want to follow you, Jesus. We want to lean into you and trust you, Jesus. Jesus, you and you alone. You are the tabernacle. You are the bridge. You are the resurrection and the life. You are God and the power of God. You are the King. And you are our Savior. And so, God, you know every need of every heart. Oh, let us lock our vision in on you, Jesus, today. With our arms open wide, with our palms up and our hands open saying, yes, Fill us. Show us your glory. Reveal yourself and we will listen and we will follow. Almighty Jesus, we pray all of this in your gracious and glorious name. Amen.